This conference will now be recorded. Today's class will be on uh, deviated nasal septum and septal surgery. Uh, this is a simple topic, but uh, it is a basic topic in ENT. But uh, it is important a topic as far as both theory as well as uh, your clinicals are concerned. Okay. Uh, we'll be dealing with this topic under these following headings. Definition, applied anatomy, the applied physiology, etiology, the classifications of deviated nasal septum, the clinical features, the investigations, and the treatment. So what is deviated nasal septum? A condition in which the septum, instead of being placed central and dividing the nasal cavity into two equal chambers of same size, is inclined to one side or the other so as to increase one cavity at the expense of the other all right am i audible yes sir, yes, sir. and yes, the sir. slides are clear yes sir and the slide and slide is seen right yes sir okay um so little bit of applied anatomy i think already anatomy would have been taken uh, i'll Tell a little bit about the anatomy of the septum. Okay, it is divided into three parts, namely the columella. Okay, uh, that is the columella, the center of the nose, and then the membranous septum, which is uh, consists, which consists only of membrane, and then the osteocartilaginous complex. Okay, the osteocartilaginous septum. Okay, uh, this is the most oftenly often dealt with uh, part, the osteocartilaginous septum. As you all know, it is made up of a cartilaginous part, the quadrangular quad cartilage, the perpendicular plate of ethmoid bone, the omer. These are the major constituents. There are other minor contributions, like inferiorly the anterior nasal spine from the maxilla, the premaxilla, the maxillary crest from the maxilla, the palatine crest from the palatine bone, the nasal bone, the uh, front, the nasal process of the nasal spine of the frontal bone anterosuperiorly and also the rostrum of sphenoid posteriorly okay this is a gist of the uh, constituents of the nasal septum so these are the major constituents uh, the quadrangular cartilage antero inferiorly this is the caudal end of the septum what we call the caudal end this is the dorsal part of the septum these are important when we deal with, uh, you know, the treatment, the surgeries of the nasal septum. This is the perpendicular plate of ethmoid, and this is the warmer. The cartilaginous part is wedged between the perpendicular plate of ethmoid and the warmer. The cartilaginous part is a hyaline cartilage, that is, the central part is acellular, whereas the peripheral part is cellular. The important thing about this septum is it has a memory okay it has a you know complex internal stress system which keeps it intact when it is disturbed then it leads to permanent warping or bending okay it undergoes the permanent change of shape when there is a disturbance suppose a trauma is there it undergoes a permanent wrapping or a bending in shape this is phrase principle that is when uh, the cartilage is you know carved make horizontal incisions on one side that is the concave side of the sep cartilage in the septum and remove strips of cartilage on the convex side then that warping will uh, will be gone and the septum will be straightened because of loss of memory this is important as far as the management of cartilaginous deviations is concerned which i'll be talking about in the surgical part The bony part consists of the vomer, the perpendicular plate of ethmoid, the palatine crest, and the maxillary crest. All right. So this is again a, a pictorial representation: the cartilaginous part, the quadrangular cartilage, the perpendicular plate of ethmoid, and the vomer. What is Cottle's line? Cottle's line is the line which is drawn from the, the nasal spine of the frontal bone to the anterior nasal spine of the maxillary bone. Okay, this is the cottle's line which divides the nose into anterior and posterior parts. 
and um, uh, you know the, the, uh, divides the uh, deviations into anterior septal deviations and posterior septal deviations. Kesselbach's plexus or the little area I've already talked about in my previous class. Uh, it is a vascular area in the antero inferior, the caudal part of the septum, which is supplied by all the vessels except the posterior ethmoidal artery. The nerve supply of the septum is by the septal branch of the anterior ethmoidal nerve and the nasopalatine nerve, which is a branch of the pterygopalatine ganglion, which comes out through the sphenopalatine foramen. It runs along with the septal branch of the sphenopalatine artery. Coming to the applied physiology of uh, nose as far as uh, septum is concerned, there is a very important area in the anterior inferior part of the uh, sept, uh, anterior inferior part of the nose. This is called as the nasal valve angle or the nasal valve area. It is a junction between the caudal end of the nasal septum and the caudal end of the upper lateral cartilages. Okay, this area is very important as far as the nasal resistance is concerned. The normal angle of, uh, of the nasal, nasal valve angle is 10 to 15 degrees. This is very important, the maintaining the valve angle. When the valve angle is acute, that is if it's less than 10 to 15 degrees, then it leads to increased resistance and in airflow to the nose and thereby causes nasal obstruction. The, con con uh, the conversely, if there is an increased angle as well, there is a reduced nasal resistance the nerve endings at the level of the nasal valve angle undergo reduced stimulation as compared to a normal angle, thereby the patient still feels a sort of nasal obstruction. So this nasal valve angle or the nasal valve area is a very important, uh, plays a very important role in maintaining the resistance of air flow into the nasal cavity and thereby plays an important role in the pathophysiology of nasal obstruction. So this is the nasal valve area during inspiration. You see how collapsed it is. And this is during expiration. It is completely opened up. What happens when there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, an increased resistance at the nasal valve area? There is negative pressure uh, created in the region of the uh, valve. You know, the Bernoulli's phenomena, right? The, what does the Bernoulli's phenomena state? When there is a narrow area and there is an increased flow of any fluid, be it air, uh, when there is an increased flow through a narrowed area, then there is a reduced pressure in the area. And this is Bernoulli's phenomena. The reduced pressure indicates that there's an, uh, sometimes there even develops a negative pressure, which leads to neg exertion of negative pressure on the side walls of the nasal valve area. And this leads to various other problems in the nose such as nasal valve area collapse, mucosal edema, and even polyp formation. So what is the etiology of the deviated nasal septum? It can occur due to trauma during or after birth. It can be a developmental error, racial differences, hereditary, high arched palate, age, the older age group are more prone, and the um, male sex is more prone for deviated nasal septum. Sorry, the younger age group are more prone because their septum is more moldable and uh, minimal trauma can change the shape of the septum uh, in the later age. So this is a prenatal uh, theory of development of nasal septum. Uh, abnormal postures of the fetus in the intrauterine life can lead to molding of the septum. It changes shape uh, due to uh, compression forces acting on the maxilla palate and the uh, nasal septum itself. There's molding of the nasal septum and this molding leads to deviated nasal septum in the later part of the life. Also intranatal during delivery, when there is a narrow pelvis, a difficult labor, or a prolonged labor, or assisted labor, such as using forceps, can be traumatic to the nose, leading to deviated nasal septum. In the postnatal life, during childhood or adulthood, even minor fractures can cause deviated nasal septum to the opposite side on healing. Differential growth theory, 
when there's a trauma in early life, they, uh, I already said there can be some caudal dislocation of the cartilage and septum, something like this. And when there is a growth uh, spurt during the early adolescence, when there's a growth spurt, then there can be a differential growth of the nasal septum, the maxilla, and the palate, leading to deviations. When there is a differential growth of each one in each direction, then it can lead to gross deviations of the nasal septum. Genetic, 4% of fetuses have uh, deviated nasal septum. Uh, the, it is uh, understood that uh, the anterior deviations are mainly traumatic, while the posterior deviations are mainly genetic. Uh, Caucasians uh, have a leptorine nose, that is, they have a sharp, you know, uh, sharp, thin nose, and these people are more prone for septal deviations uh, per se. The other causes could be mouth breathing, thumb sucking, poor dentition, and uh, nasal masses such as polyps and uh, benign and malignant tumors. Classification of deviated nasal septum. According to the pathological anatomy, it can be classified as angulations, dislocations, or deviations. And according to the site of the deviation, it can be a high septal deviation or a low septal deviation an anterior or posterior deviated nasal septum. Cortis classification, if there is a mild deviation with no obstruction, then it is a simple uh, deviation. If there is a severe deviation, uh, when the septum, the, when there's a spur or a deviation coming and touching the lateral wall, but uh, uh, you know it is not impinging on the lateral wall, then it is an obstructed deviation. And if there is a marked angulation with impingement on the lateral wall of the nose, then it becomes impacted. What is the difference between this obstructed and impacted is that when we place a decongestant pack in the nose, if the, de if the you know, deviation, uh, if there is a, uh, after decongestion, if there is space for breathing, then it is an obstructed type of deviation. And if there is uh, no, uh, space for breathing even after decongestion, keeping decongestant packs like xylometazolin or oxymetazolin. If there is still no space for breathing, then it is an impacted sort of deviation. There are other classifications as well. Mladenus classification is wherein type 1 is midline septum or mild deviation in vertical or horizontal plane. Type 2 is anterior vertical deviation. Type 3 is posterior vertical deviation. Type 4 is a shaped septum. Posteriorly, it's deviated to one side and anteriorly to the other side. So this is uh, the types of Mladenus classification. This is a mild deviation to one side. This is, uh, you know, anterior deviation to one side. Type 3 is, uh, you know, posterior deviation to one side. Type 4 is an S-shaped deviation that is posteriorly it is deviated to one side, anteriorly to the other side. Type 5 is a sharp spur on one side, uh, you know, a horizontal spur on one side. And type 6 is combination of all these varieties. Uh, I mean, type 6 is a sharp spur on one side with a grooving on the other side, whereas type 7 is a combination of all these varieties. Negus classification of deviation. It can be divided into spurs, deviation, or a combination of spurs and deviation. Deviation can be C-shaped, S-shaped, angular deviation, or too irregular to merit. Ballinger's classification is deviation without external deformity, uh, deviation associated with external nasal deformity, and isolated deformities like spur and ridge. Most important of these are, uh, you know, cottage classification and Mladenus classification. The others are all of historical importance. What will happen if there is a deviated nasal septum? There can be a compensatory hypertrophy of the inferior turbinate on the opposite side. There can be an external deformity like this. There can be a crooked nose deformity on the external aspect, leading to you know cosmetic deformities. And there could be impaired sinus drainage if there is a deviation of the nasal septum, gross deviation, impinging of the middle turbinate with, by, and pushing the middle turbinate laterally. And uh, there is reduced uh, space in the middle meatus. 
and thereby there's impaired sinus drainage leading to secondary sinusitis and this will in fact lead on to secondary atrophic rhinitis as well and uh, there could be mucosal changes and altered air currents so this is a ct picture showing a sharp deviation you can see how it is impinging on the lateral wall of the nose this can reduce the you know area in the middle meatus leading to reduced sinus drainage compared to the opposite side you can see how much of reduction of uh, you know middle meatus space is present what are the symptoms when there is a deviated nasal septum most of the patients are most of the people you know around 80 to 90 percent of the people have a deviated nasal septum but only some of them have uh, symptoms what are the symptoms they present with the most important symptom they present with is nasal obstruction followed by headache nasal discharge external deformity hyposmia or anosmia that is reduced or absent smell sensation and epistaxis i talked to you about this in the epistaxis seminar when there's a sharp spur or deviation there can be bleeding from the summit of the spur recurrent bleeding can be there which have to be dealt with surgically so what are the clinical uh, uh, features the nasal obstruction is the most common symptom usually it's unilateral to the side of obstruction or maybe bilateral there is a something called as paradoxical nasal obstruction you know there is a nasal cycle which is going on in, in the uh, physiologically in the nose you know there is alternate decongestion and congestion of the nose especially of the inferior turbinates the congestion will help in reduce ciliary motility and thereby uh, uh, collection of mucus and moisturizing of the nasal cavity which is one of the you know uh, physiological uh, uh, you know functions of the nose and uh, during this congestion phase uh, on the opposite side of the deviation patient will feel a nasal obstruction this is called as paradoxical nasal obstruction headache due to associated sinusitis and anterior ethmoidal nerve syndrome when there is an impacted DNS, uh, you know, uh, impinging on the lateral wall where the anti-ethmoidal nerve supplies, it can cause irritation of the ner nerve endings and this can lead on to headache. Uh, nasal discharge due to obstruction of flow of mucus to the uh, nasopharynx. Any questions? Any question? No, sir. Okay. Um, external nasal deformity it can be classified as uh, you know the cartilaginous deviation only the cartilaginous part of the external nose is deviated a uh, c-shaped where bony deviation to one side and cartilaginous deviation to the other side whereas uh, s-shaped is wherein uh, you know the bony is deviated to one side the upper cartilaginous wall to other side and the lower cartilaginous wall to the same side this is an s-shaped external deviation Okay. This is basically called as, you know, the crooked nose deformity. The S-shaped external nasal deformity is called as the crooked nose. On examining the patient, when you just ask the patient to look up and uh, uh, visualize the nasal uh, nares, you can see if there is a caudal dislocation of the nasal septum, you can see uh, just by examining the, uh, uh, you know, um, nares of the patient. When you do an anterior rhinoscopic examination, you can see the site and type of the deviation. If there is a compensatory turbinate hypertrophy, you can determine the mucosal status. Is there a mucosal congestion and uh, any discharge in the meatus? You can do a posterior rhinoscopy to look for the discharge. Uh, a cold spatula test. What is cold spatula test is we keep a tongue depressor, uh, you know, tongue depressor instrument uh, to, uh, you know, examine the oral cavity. We keep that horizontally below the nose and we see if there is equal misting when the patient expires, there'll be misting on the tongue depressor. If there is equal misting, then there is uh, no obstruction. If there is reduced misting on one side, then there is obstruction on that side. That is cold spatula test. Cottle's maneuver. What is Cottle's maneuver? You just uh, uh, keep your hand over the, you know, uh, cheek of the face and retract the cheek laterally. And uh, if there is improvement in patient's breathing, 
then it indicates that there is an obstruction in that part of the nose that is the nasal valve area on that side is obstructed whereas if there is no relief uh, even after doing a cortis test then the nasal valve area is intact lignocaine plus adrenaline application this i already talked to you about to differentiate between an obstructed and impacted type of septal deviation so investigations what are the investigations we do we do an x-ray paranasal sinus nasal endoscopy is diagnostic we can do a ct scan for paranasal sinus to rule out, uh, to look for the septal deviation to look for turbinate hypertrophy and to look for the sinuses and we do routine blood investigations to uh, if the patient is planned for surgery and we also do uh, an objective assessment of nasal obstruction this is done uh, only in uh, uh you know uh, patients uh, usually it is not done these days it is done only uh, in research purposes and so on uh, rhino manometry and acoustic rhino manometry are objective measures of determining nasal obstruction x-ray pns uh, you can see the septal deviation to the left side there is a sharp spur on the left side and there is a turbinate hypertrophy on the right side you can make out right this is the uh, you know pyriform aperture this is the nasal septum in the midline there's a sharp spur to the left side and there is a turbinate hypertrophy on the right side you can also see there is haziness on the left maxillary sinus as compared to the right maxillary sinus indicating the maxillary sinusitis so this is nasal endoscopy you can see there is a high deviation to the left side and there is a spur small spur, spur on the uh, near the floor of the nose and uh, you can see the inferior turbinate and the middle turbinate in the picture. CT scan, this is a CT scan showing a sharp spur to the left side and uh, a right inferior turbinate hypertrophy. Rhino manometry, I, as I already told, it's an objective measurement. It is hardly done these days. It is done only for research purposes most of the time. Uh, it can be divided into anterior rhino manometry and posterior rhino manometry. Anterior rhino manometry is wherein a pressure catheter is fixed to one nostril and the flow is measured through the other. Um, there should be no exercise within 30 minutes before the testing. There should be no mouth breathing and hyperventilation. Uh, the graph of airflow and pressure is obtained. With this, you can measure the, you know, the resistance of airflow in the nasal cavity and uh, you can even determine the uh, uh, you know, increased resistance in one of the nasal cavity caused by septal deviation. Posterior rhino manometry is the same as the anterior, just that the pressure catheter is kept in the pharynx through the mouth and the lips are sealed. Uh, the advantage of this is that there's distor no distortion of the nostril as in anterior rhino manometry, and it's more accurate. The disadvantage is that it's more cumbersome. Passive rhino manometry is not used these days. And acoustic rhino manometry is something similar to, uh, you know, ultrasound. Sound waves are passed into the nasal cavity, which gets reflected from various structures and gets collected in the, uh, you know, instrument. And this determines, you know, the uh, resistance of airflow in the nasal cavity. Going on to treatment of deviated nasal septum. Deviated nasal septum is, as you all know, it is an anatomical abnormality. It is not a physiological, uh, pathophysiological abnormality, okay? It is present as an anatomical abnormality and hence it can be corrected only surgically. Medical management is only to, uh, you know, control the associated problems like uh, rhinitis and sinusitis, can give antibiotics, antihistamines, anti-inflammatory drugs and nasal decongestants. The definitive option for treatment is surgical. The septal surgery dates back to as, three, uh, as uh, old as 3500 BC, where Ebers Papyrus has given the first uh, description about uh, the septal procedure. The people who uh, you know popularized uh, the septal surgery are these two uh, gentlemen, Frears and Killians. Uh, Frears made a more radical approach of removing the entire septum but this had its own complications. So Killians developed a conservative method with prevention of dorsal and uh, with pr uh, pr protection of the dorsal and caudal studs. Uh, 
This is called a submucous resection, which I will be dealing with later. Medzenbaum is one who, you know, uh, 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 described the swinging door technique in cases of caudal dislocation of the nasal septum. Uh, he uh, he explained how you know you uh, develop a submucosal plane, a submucopericondrial plane, and uh, remove a piece of the cartilage and swing the caudal end into the anterior nasal spine and fix it to the anterior nasal spine so that it becomes uh, straight. This is called as the swinging door technique of medicine bump. Next came uh, resection of the entire cartilage and replacing it. You know, uh, there are uh, different ways of removing uh, the, the septal cartilage can be removed as a whole and it can be shaped and uh, kept uh, in, uh, you know, horizontally or vertically, whichever orientation. But uh, these have their own problems. You know, what happens when you remove the entire septal cartilage is unequal scar contraction between the flaps and the rec recurrence of the septal deviation. There can be absorption of the autograft cartilage and lower end of graft immobilize the columella, giving it an unnatural appearance. They can even develop a columella retraction following excessive removal of the septal cartilage. Following this came the uh, development of, you know, septoplasty and submucosal resection. Uh, septoplasty was uh, the main proponents of septoplasty were Converse, Becker, Goldman, and Cottle. This man, Cottle, was the one who, you know, popularized the technique of the maxilla, pre-maxilla approach, which is still popularly being used in the management of septal deviations. So these are the various procedures which we use for treatment of uh, septal deviations, septoplasty, submucous resection, and off-late. More often, uh, we follow an endoscopic septoplasty with the advent of endoscopes. What are the indications of septoplasty? Septal deviations producing nasal obstructions, correction of external deviation. We combine septoplasty with correction of external deformity of the nose, and donor site for cartilage graft. We can take the septal cartilage and use it as a graft for various procedures. In, in fact, the reconstruction of the septum itself, the reconstruction of uh, you know skull base defects to close CSF leaks, uh, CSF rhinorrhea, uh, and also for various other reconstruction procedures and uh, repair of septal perforations. Uh, uh, when there is a septal perforation, a septoplasty approach is used to close the septal perforations and insertion of dorsal spreadle grafts. That is, grafts can be placed on the dorsum of uh, nose to augment the dorsum of nose in case of saddle nose deformities. The pre-medications which are given in uh, uh, you know, local anesthesia, uh, low, low, uh, septoplasty under local anesthesia are atropin, promethazin, and pentazosin. Uh, these are uh, promethazin reduces anxiety, pentazosin reduces pain, and atropin is used to reduce uh, secretions. Uh, um, uh, this septoplasty or uh, submucous resection can be carried out by local anesthesia or general anesthesia. Nowadays, we prefer more of general anesthesia over local anesthesia, especially while treating you know, bony deviations, especially the pre-maxillary, the maxillary crest uh, deviations, uh, which are hard to remove uh, you know, uh, just by um, uh, manual methods. We need to use a lot of force and patient cooperation will not be there. And hence, we prefer more of general anesthesia in such cases. We use 4% xylocaine for, for packing the nose uh, uh, with packs uh, to locally anesthetize the nose. And also 2% xylocaine with 1 in 1 lakh or 1 in 2 lakh adrenaline combination. We use to infiltrate the nasal septum. This infiltration uh, is made in the submucopericondrial or the mucoperiosteal plane. I'll show you a video at the end about that. This infiltration is done, one, to anesthetize the mucosa. Two, it acts as a hydrodissection. That is, infiltrating in this, uh, in this location elevates the flap by itself uh, all over and thereby makes our flap elevation uh, quite easier uh, uh, for the surgeon. We can use a maximum of four to seven milligram per kg of xylocaine for infiltration. We usually use a 25 to 26 gauge needle for infiltration. 
and the mucosa should be completely blanched for uh, you know a bloodless field this uh, proids maneuver is no longer used these days so you don't worry about that uh, what are the phases of septoplasty gaining uh, first first would be gaining access to the septum that is we have to make the incision and uh, develop the flaps or elevate the flaps and then you have to correct the septal pathology if there is a pathology which has to be removed then it has to be removed and then you reshape the cartilage and bone and then they reconstruct the septum and stabilize it with either sutures or uh, you know packing what are the various incisions which are available for us the freer's hemi transfixation incision this uh, 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 this is a uh, made just two millimeter posterior to edge of the uh, external nasal cavity. Uh, it is made just at the edge of the caudal end of the nasal septum. It, the, you should make sure the incision is not on the membranous part of the septum because it causes contracture in the membranous part and leads to you know, uh, columella retraction. Uh, the incision should be made exactly at the caudal end of the cartilaginous nasal septum, all right? For that, how do you do that? Uh, it is uh, the columella is retracted to one side, and uh, you make the cartilage prominent to the exterior. And where the caudal end of the cartilage ends, you make an incision at that point. That is Freer's incision. All right. What are the advantages? It is uh, gives a uh, avascular plane, squamous epithelium anteriorly. When you uh, you know when you make an incision here, it is exactly at the uh, squamous columnar junction. There will be uh, some amount of skin there, which is more pliable. And it uh, it uh, whereas when you make an incision on the mucosa, it tends to tear when you elevate the flap. Whereas when it is on the uh, you know mucocutaneous junction, it is more pliable and tensile strength is more and hence there's less chances of tear of the flap while elevation of the flap and it gives access to the whole of the septum and it can be easily extended to a full transfixation incision which is used to, to correct uh, uh, you know uh, external deformities in rhinoplasty you have to include the perichondrium in the incision to find the subperichondrial plane for dissection and this makes the flap much tougher once the flap is elevated, uh, usually best to expose the cartilaginous and bony septum, elevating mucosal flap on the concave side of the deviation. Uh, usually it is uh, safer on the concave side because it prevents uh, flap tap during elevation. But however, nowadays we prefer uh, to early identify the deviation by elevating on the convex side. Uh, I'll explain to you about that in the video, all right? Uh, it is uh, the flap is easily elevated at the ethmo warmerine suture and the ethmo septal cartilage suture. You know the uh, wedge between the cartilage, the warmer and the um, perpendicular plate of ethmoid. That is a site where the flap is easy to elevate as compared to the other sites. It is very difficult to elevate uh, at the junction of septal cartilage with the anterior nasal spine, pre-maxillary crest, and the warmer. This area is called as the inferior tunnel, okay? Um, this area is called as the inferior tunnel, which I'll show you. This area has a very tight, uh, you know, adhesion to the uh, septum and uh, the elevation of the flap in this area becomes very difficult. So this is how the incision is made, the prayer's incision, and you elevate the flap in all directions, the anterosuperior flap, the, uh, 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 the posterosuperior direction, the antero inferior and the postero inferior. This antero inferior and postero inferior direction is where there is a tight adherence of the flap to the septum, and it's very difficult to elevate the flap. Why it is difficult to elevate the flap? This is the reason. Uh, you know the um, uh, periosteum of the max maxillary spine and the uh, maxillary crest is very tough, and it forms a separate covering and the perichondrium forms a separate covering along the uh, septal cartilage and this junction near the floor this area we have to make a sharp cuts with the knife to you know gain access to elevate the this part of the nasal tunnel you know th this part is called as the inferior tunnel of the flap which is very difficult to elevate you have to make sharp cuts here to elevate this part to correct deviations at the 
uh, near the floor of the nasal septum. The cortis maxilla, premaxilla approach, he is the one who developed this uh, approach where we make anterior tunnels and uh, posterior tunnels and the inferior tunnels. The antero superior and uh, postero superior tunnels and antero inferior and postero inferior tunnels. Okay, see, this is how it is done. The anterior, this is the uh, antero superior tunnel which is elevated. This is the inferior tunnel which is elevated separately. You can see there is tight adhesion there. This has to be sharply released with a sharp instrument like knife to elevate this part. And uh, this connects the anterior tunnel and the inferior tunnel. And this is how the flap has to be elevated without a tear. So once the flap has been elevated without a tear, next we have to treat the deformity in the septal cartilage. Uh, uh, you can dislocate, if there is a caudal dislocation, then your dislocation of the, you can dislocate the cartilage from the osseous base and the anterior nasal spine, remove an inferior strip of cartilage, you know, uh, the uh, a strip of cartilage, the inferior part of the cartilage in the septum can be removed in cases of caudal dislocation, and that will correct most of the cartilage in its uh, deviations. When the anterior nasal spine is deviated, then you can fracture it and reposition it in the midline, and that will help to correct the uh, anterior nasal spine deformities. When there is a severe angulated deformity like spurs, then that part of the spur has to be removed uh, separately. Once all these uh, deviated pa uh, abnormal parts have been removed, then you can reshape the uh, sept uh, our remaining septum and uh, uh, you know make it straight. If there is no adequate material to reshape the septum, then you can use uh, septal uh, materials to reconstruct the septum. The septal cartilage, which has been removed, that itself can be used to reconstruct. And then the ear cartilage, the conchal bowel cartilage can be used. And the rib cartilage also can be used for reconstruction of the nasal septum. The, once the reconstruction is over, then the dressing of the nose uh, uh, with mattress sutures and splints have to be done to keep it in midline. The septum should freely lie in the midline without any traction for preventing recurrence. If there are multiple incisions which are made, then it has to be sutured by quilting suture to keep it in position. Stabilization can also be done with splints kept in the nasal cavity like these but these can cause increased post-operative pain and discomfort and rarely toxic shock syndrome. And hence, uh, they are not used uh, nowadays uh, for, uh, however, they can be uh, used in the prevention of sinusitis. If there is an extensive surgery, uh, a septal correction as well as a turbinate correction has been done. And if you feel that there can be a sinusitis developing between the septum and the turbinate, then you can place this to prevent a sinusitis formation. What are the complications of uh, septal surgery? They can be bleeding, uh, they can be septal hematoma and abscess postoperatively, they can be hematoma collection between the flaps because we have elevated the flaps and there is no septum in between. In cases of uh, you know places where you have removed the septal cartilage or the bone, there can be collection of hematoma in that region and that can turn into a pus leading to abscess. This can lead to absorption of the entire nasal septum and leading to nasal deformities. Uh, they can, uh, if you make through and through incisions, that is, there is a tear in the flap and the, uh, you have removed a part of the septum and there is tear in the opposite side of the flap as well, then it's a hold, right? The, that part of the hole will, uh, most often, if it's a linear tear, it will heal. But if there are large tears, then it can lead on to the formation of perforations in the septum or the septal perforations. And uh, sometimes they can be, if it's not improperly, if it's improperly corrected, then it can lead to persistence of deviations. Going on to submucous resection. Till now, we were talking about septoplasty. It is a conservative procedure. Uh, it is just to correct the deviated part of the septum alone, whereas submucous resection is used for you know more complicated deviations where there is a, a shaped deviation with a horizontal spur impinging on the lateral wall. And uh, what are the differences between submucous resection and uh, you know septoplasty? Uh, 
Uh, septoplasty, as I said, is a conservative method, but a submucous resection is you remove the entire septum. I'll show you, uh, except a dorsal strut and a uh, columella strut, you remove the entire uh, septum. Uh, uh, SMR can not be done in young individuals, uh, uh, suppose less than 16 years of age, a submucous resection cannot be done because there will be growth spurt during adolescence. And uh, if we remove the entire septum, the, the differential growth of the uh, septum and palates can lead on to facial abnormalities as well. So submucous resection should not be done in early life. Uh, so if there is a gross deviation in pediatric age group, which is causing uh, uh, you know a problem with day-to-day -day activities, we prefer to do septoplasty as compared to submucosal resection. Okay. Where uh, in sub uh, septoplasty we use a freer incision, as I already told you, it is a more anterior de uh, incision at the level of the mucocutaneous junction. Whereas submucous resection, we leave the caudal part of the uh, septal cartilage. So the incision is a little bit posterior in the nasal mucosa itself, like 2 mm posterior to the mucocutaneous junction. And that incision is called as Killian's incision. All right. What are the indications of a, a submucous resection and impacted deviated nasal septum? Source of graft material for reconstructions. Uh, we, uh, as I already told, we harvest uh, septal cartilage for various reconstructions. And deviated nasal septum posterior to line joining the nasal crest of maxilla and frontal bones. That is the cortical line. Deviations posterior to the uh, cortical line. Uh, it is safer to do a submucous resection than a septoplasty. So that is a, a incision which is used in uh, uh, submucous resection. It's a Killian's incision just behind the mucocutaneous junction. That is a Killian's incision. You can see the incision made at the level of the mucosa. Is it clear, guys? The uh, uh, thing is clear. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, the yes, slide sir. is clear. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Um, so this is a Killian's incision, which is made in the mucosa, just behind the, muc the mucocutaneous junction is somewhere here. And the incision is made just behind the mucocutaneous junction. And you can see how the flap, the mucoperichondrial flaps are being elevated from the septum using a perichondrial elevator. So these are the various elevators, the Freer's elevator, the Cottle's elevator, which are used in septal surgeries. Uh, you know, this elevator is used to elevate the flaps. And once the flap is elevated, then we can remove the cartilage uh, by making cuts uh, inferiorly and superiorly, and then using the Ballinger swivel knife. This is called the Ballinger swivel knife. This is how the tip will be. I'll be showing you in the video. Once you make the superior and inferior cuts in the cartilage, you can pass this knife, and uh, 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 and you can remove the cartilage as a whole. So in submucous resection, as I told, we preserve one centimeter strut of cartilage dorsally to prevent a saddle nose deformity. Uh, 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 and then um, the excess part can be removed by bayonet flaps, approx uh, bayonet, and then flaps approximated and sutured by absorbable sutures, and then nasal packing can be done. So this is SMR, okay? Uh, once you elevate the flaps uh, by Achilles, through Achilles incision, you, you uh, maintain the score, uh, caudal strut and the dorsal strut and remove the entire re remaining part of the uh, septum in total, okay? Uh, you know, wh what is the problem? Why you, you know, retain this dorsal strut is that if you remove excessive amount of uh, this dorsal strut, it leads to saddle nose deformity. You know, the uh, support of the external nose is lost and it causes depression of the nose called a saddle nose deformity. And if you remove excess cartilage in the caudal part, you know, if you remove this part of the cartilage, then it leads to retraction of the columella because of fibrosis. The columella retraction happens. It gives an uh, ugly look uh, to the uh, external face. So this is a saddle nose deformity. You see the entire nose goes inside because of this. And uh, the columella, usually it should be seen in the side profile. It undergoes retraction if you... Uh, you know, remove excess uh, cartilage in the caudal part of the septum. These are the other complications. Uh, bleeding can happen, septal again, septal hematoma, septal abscess, uh, uh, perforations of the septum can happen. And I already told uh, uh, depression of bridge of nose and columnar retraction can also occur.
endoscopic septoplasty it was described by lanza and stamberger this is the you know most commonly used procedure these days because with the advent of endoscope the visualization has greatly greatly improved it gives a good magnification a very good illumination and uh, early recognition of mucosal tears or disruptions of their present gives an improved access it's useful for teaching purposes for teaching the undergraduates and the postgraduates and it uh, it is uh, used as a combined procedure with other procedures like sinus surgeries how do you do it you examine the nasal cavity with the endoscope localization you determine the degree of septal deviation in spur you identify the landmarks then you make a killian's incision flap elevation in the submucopericondrial plane and uh, for correction of septal cartilage you can do scoring of septal cartilage you remember the fry's principle which i told you you make scoring on once on the concave side and remove strips of cartilage on the convex side and that will make the septal cartilage to lose its memory and straighten up okay this is uh, uh, this can be done and um, you can uh, make incision on the cartilage go on to the other side elevate the submucopericondrial flap on the other side you resect the bony and cartilaginous deviations and then mucosal flap is reapproximated then you close the incision with absorbable sutures and uh, you know pack the nose this is a post operative picture of an endoscopic septoplasty that has been done you can see how uh, the septum uh, the flap has been uh, 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 you know elevated and uh, there is no tear or disruptions in the uh, flap which has been elevated and then it has been reapproximated uh, i'll uh, show you a video of septoplasty now uh, these are the complications of septoplasty it is the same as a uh, routine septoplasty uh, the endoscopic septoplasty has the same complications as a uh, uh, routine septoplasty uh, it can co also cause dental numbness scarring septal perforation csf leak if you keep pulling uh, you know uh, the bony nasal septum the perpendicular plate of ethmoid there are chances that if, uh, you know uh, there can be deviations in the skull base and that leads to csf leak uh, once the surgery is done regular post operative follow up can be done with nasal endoscopy to uh, uh, ensure optimal healing has taken place so i'll show you a video of the um, septopla uh, smr procedure endoscopic smr procedure is the video visible hello yes sir yes sir okay you can see how the infiltration uh, infiltration is done with a 26 gauge needle the anterior inferior part and then this is the infiltration on the left side on the bony part of the septum you can see how the uh, mucosa blanches with the infiltration this is infiltration the cartilaginous part of the septum you can see how the mucosa gets blanched out this is how it has to be blanched out to have a bloodless feel and to elevate a good plane this type of infiltration should be achieved so the incision free uh, killian's incision has been made and the mucopericondrial flaps are being elevated you can see inferiorly even the inferior tunnel is being elevated and uh, this is the septal cartilage okay the uh, septal cartilage is seen uh, while elevating the flap uh sept endoscopic uh, you know septal corrections have undergone modifications okay when we elevate the uh, uh, flap on the cartilaginous part then we make an incision on the cartilage you can see i'm making an incision on the septal cartilage and then we directly go to the other side and elevate uh, you know mucosal flap on the other side okay sub mucopericondrial flap on the other side see i'm using a freya's uh, elevator to elevate uh, muco sub muco pericondrial flap on the other side you should ensure that there is no flap tear during this elevation okay uh, to prevent uh, future uh, septal perforations and so on you can see the tunnel being elevated on the opposite side 
can see how uh, it's a good avascular plane that I'm getting. This is possible with a good infiltration, and uh, you, can, uh, you can see the amount of visualization that we get with the endoscopic uh, septal correction. Now I'm cutting superiorly and inferiorly with the scissors. Once I do that, I use the Bellinger swivel knife. Okay, that is uh, the Bellinger swivel knife. You can see it just goes inside, swipes out the cartilaginous part. Okay, you can just take the cartilaginous part as a single piece. Once that is done, and this is a modification in the endoscopic uh, septoplasty or septal correction. Once the septal cartilage is removed, we have enough space to elevate the bony uh, sub, sub mucoperiosteal flaps. You can see the bone clearly. I'm elevating the flap from the uh, perpendicular plate of ethmoid and the oma. Whereas in a, a routine septoplasty or SMR, we initially itself we elevate the entire flap. But whereas in endoscopic uh, septoplasty or SMR, we identify the areas and then elevate part by part. Now you can see uh, part of the cartilaginous septum is there, which is still removed. And now you can see the uh, flap being elevated from the bony septum. That is the perpendicular plate of ethmoid. And inferiorly is the woma. So this is flap elevation on the left side, OK? And now I'm elevating the flap on the right side. I'm freeing the entire bony septum from the both sides flaps. I'm also elevating the inferior tunnel, uh, you know, to look for the deviations. There's a sharp septal spur there at the junction of the uh, uh, womer with the uh, you know, perpendicular plate of ethmoid. I make, I prefer making sharp cuts on the bone to remove the bony pieces. Okay, I'm doing an SMR, right? So I'm uh, using sharp cuts to release the bone and then removing them part by part. You can see I have maintained a superior uh, strut of cartilage uh, to prevent saddle nose deformity. These are the bony parts which are being removed. I'm checking if the correction is adequate. And only inferiorly, there is a small spur. I'm chiseling it out. You can see I'm using gouge and hammer, chiseling out uh, you know, the ma uh, maxillary strut or the uh, mag. Uh, uh, maxillary crest uh, which is projecting to the right side that has been removed and now you can see the entire septum deviation has been corrected okay there is no absolutely no tear in the flap okay this is the advantage of endoscopic septoplasty the inferior turbinate and middle turbinate are clearly seen now the nasopharynx you can see up to the nasopharynx that is how the visualization should be there after a proper correction and this is on the left side you can see this side also there is no flap there and uh, there is a proper correction which has been done okay understood Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. okay, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Wonderful class. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you.